Hello, good morning. Um, as Dave said, my name is Paya Levine. I'm with the County Planning Department. Thank you to the Water Agency for inviting me, and thank you to Tom for the really um, uh, able setup of what the regulatory environment is. So that's going to allow me to go quicker through some of those uh, slides, and then we'll have more time to just kind of converse about the issues. So if you see me speeding through slides, it's because Tom did such a, uh, a good job for me. Thank you. So one of the comments I, I heard already is that there's a perceived disconnect between the way uh, land use planning is done and the way the water agencies do water planning. And so I'd like to address that right away, which is that um, Tom described how there's a structure for the back and forth between uh, resource issues like water and land use planning. And within that structure, uh, the unincorporated county, at least, which is where the county um, uh, is responsible for land use planning, there's actually a pretty robust back and forth that happens all the time within that structure, the way it's prescribed to happen. And um, it happens on at least these three levels on kind of an ongoing basis. There's the high, sort of the higher level, which is the general plan that Tom described. There are the detailed ordinances and regulations down to the level of building permit that prescribe um, water conservation and how water will be used. And then there is the um, individual project review that happens. When a development permit comes through for a permit of some type, we check to ensure that there's water availability to serve that project. That's the will serve letter that Tom mentioned. And the county largely relies on the water purveyor, that is the water agency, to let us know that they can indeed um, verify that there's adequate supply to serve. The county's role is one of consulting, connecting with, and um, giving comments to the water agencies. The water agencies are the ones with the, the detailed expertise and the data, and we work with them on kind of an ongoing basis. So I hope that that addresses that, um, that comment about this connection. AMBAG is the acronym for the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, and that is the regional planning organization that the County of Santa Cruz is a part of. Their planning area covers three counties, San Benito, Monterey, and ourselves. AMBAG produces, on a cycle of every four years, a data-driven forecast for the expected employment growth, population growth, and housing need in that area, and they break that forecast down for each individual jurisdiction in the AMBAG area. So we're going to look at that forecast because when the county is doing its planning, and right now the county is at the beginning of an update of several elements of our general plan, including the land use element, the circulation element, um, and community design. We uh, completed an update of our housing element uh, about a year ago, last summer. Um, we, we do that planning under the umbrella of this forecast. A lot of numbers here. Really what I just want you to see from this is that the employment um, forecast, the increase in jobs for the, the unincorporated area of Santa, Santa Cruz boils down to one number, which is over the period 2015 to 2040, so 25 years, and 18% growth in employment. That is, in the scheme of things, a very modest number. Thank you. Um, because employment drives population, the next step is a population forecast. For the county of Santa Cruz, the unincorporated area, over this period of time, it's 5% or a total of about 6,600 people over 25 years. So once again, that's fairly modest. And the reason I'm sort of making that point is this is the data of our best understanding of what we can expect for population growth. And people are usually surprised by how kind of low and slow the growth projection, uh, the growth projection is. And um, I can let people know where this is available online, and you can look at it and get into the details you know, at your leisure. Um, 
this is the housing that uh, the housing forecast that goes along with the population forecast. And um, total number of about 3,500 units in the whole unincorporated area over 25 years. Um, back for just a minute. Tom mentioned, but didn't give a lot of details about um, uh, other things that operate when we do our, our, our planning. And one of them is um, in 1979, there was a voter initiative called Measure J that set out a growth management strategy for the county. And we still, of course, follow that. And the planning department reports to our board of supervisors every year um, about setting a growth goal and about how many building permits we issued in the previous year. So this is kind of a reality check on the forecast. This tells us how many permits are we actually issuing. And in the last column, you can see the number we issued relative to the number that were available. The number that we issued doesn't include deed-restricted, subsidized, affordable housing, and it doesn't include accessory dwelling units. Those are the uh, little backyard secondary units. But other than that, last year, um, we issued about 60 relative to a reservoir that was available of, a, of 256. And you can see these numbers are, are just pretty modest. So the, I, I point that out so we can think about that when we think about what's in vision and uh, large urban areas and, and that kind of um, idea. I think lastly I'll show, uh, this is the boundaries of the water, this water agency on a general plan map. And the general plan, the current general plan, uh, has minimum lot sizes. So for a rural area, the way the growth typically happens is by land division. We have fairly high minimum lot sizes of between 10 and 40 acres. So uh, wherever that forecast growth occurs, it's not, it's not expected to be in this area. Um, it is expected to be more in the urban parts of the county, closer to transit, along our transit corridors, we expect and are planning toward more compact kinds of development. And that kind of development not only helps us with our housing shortage, but it's less water using than the single family dwelling on a larger lot. Uh, mixed use is a part of uh, what we'll be talking about in the new general plan, where you mix commercial and residential uses. You create kind of a walkable, uh, neighborhood that people enjoy being in, and also it tends to be more resource conserving, um, not just with water, but also um, it limits the amount of driving that people need to do, and it can help drive down our greenhouse gas emissions. So we have this overall plan to go towards sustainability and um, take the growth that we expect, which is modest, and locate it in the smartest places that we can. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, can you hear me? I don't think I'll be as uh, compelling as Paya, we'll see. <laughs> uh, my name is Sarah Fleming and I am principal planner overseeing our long range planning and policy team with the city of Santa Cruz, also known as advanced planning. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit today about uh, planning and land use in the city of Santa Cruz. So, let me figure out how to make this, oh, okay. That's what I was doing, but it wasn't moving. There we go. Is it there? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of history on the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we were incorporated in 1866 as a manufacturing and shipping center. And we had our first city charter adopted in 1876, and our current city manager style of government was adopted in 1948. Uh, the reality is, is that we're very influenced by UCSC. Um, the, the, the campus has impacted the city's development substantially uh, uh, post-World War II. Uh, the university has a separate planning process from the city. We do not have jurisdiction over the university. Um, and they go through a process called the Long Range Development Plan, or LRDP. So you'll probably hear that a lot um, 
currently they're in the process of updating their existing LRDP, so they're pretty uh, entrenched in their own planning process right now. Um, due to the development of the university, their, their first LRDB came out in 63 and the campus opened in 65. Uh, in the 70s, the city's growth expanded by about 30%, so a uh, definite impact on the city. Uh, the current student population is at about 19.5, and um, in their LRDP process, they are looking at a much larger population over the term of that development. Um, I don't know where they're at recently, but the last I heard it was close uh, upwards of about 28,000 students that they're going to be planning for long term. So not tomorrow, but over, over the course of the, their next long range development plan planning window, which will probably be about 15 years, 15, 20 years. Uh, so a little bit of history um, in terms of uh, master plans or general plans. In 1937, the state passed some legislation that said, hey, jurisdictions, you need to create a master plan. In 1955, the state uh, changed the terminology to uh, general plans, so they're interchangeable. Uh, you might hear both, but typically jurisdictions um, refer to them as general plans. Uh, the city's general plan history in 1963, concurrent with the LRDP development uh, for the university, the city developed our first general plan. And we've done comprehensive updates subsequently since then, 1980, 1990, and most recently in 2012. And that document is the document we're using now. It's called General Plan 2030. So the plan is that that plan will um, stretch through the planning period through 2030, although we'll probably start maybe mid-2020s, 2025 ish, uh, working on our next general plan. So uh, present day, our current population is just over 65,000 people. And in each decade since 1990, the city has grown uh, an average of about 10.5%. Uh, we are on track for that now. Um, the most recent data on the census website shows that we're at about 8.5% growth and that that 10 year period for the census ends in uh, next year, 20, or this year or next year, 2020, 2019, 2020. So we're on track. We're a little bit behind, and we'll see, we will have seen that in the last census uh, period. Uh, the 1990 period, we were at about 11% growth. The last period, we were at about 9.5% growth. And as of today, we're, or 2017, we're at about 8.5% um, growth. So um, we're running on track. All the growth is slowing a little bit, it seems. Um, our general plan 2030 was adopted in 2012. Again, as I mentioned, the period runs through 2030. Uh, our general plan has all of the state required elements, the seven elements, um, which if you would quiz me on them, it might take me a second to tell you what they are, but they're standard mobility, um, uh, open space, things of that nature. Jurisdictions also have the opportunity, if they're interested in, to create additional elements or review additional elements in their general plan. The city's decided to do that in this last general plan. And uh, what we've added is historic preservation, community design, economic development, and civic and community facilities. That last one is where most of our water policies reside, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So the vision statement for GP 2030 is that uh, surrounded by Greenbelt and the Pacific Ocean, Santa Cruz is a compact, vibrant city that preserves the diversity and quality of its natural and built environments creates a satisfying quality of life for its diverse population and workers, and attracts visitors from around the world. So through that, you can kind of see that the heart of the plan really is development that is sustainable. Um, in the plan, there are much like the principles, the guiding principles that we see in the back room here where the coffee and snacks are a very important room. Um, the, you'll see that there are a, a principle of a variety of principles related to a variety of topics that really set the stage for the policies in the plan. And I think it's really important to note that the very first guiding principle relates to natural resources. So what we say in regard to that is that we will highlight and protect our unique setting, our natural and established open space, and the sustainable use of our precious natural resources. So that is the principle guiding principle, principle guiding principle of our plan. So in terms of uh, GP 2030 and water, um, the city service area is 30 square miles, and I'm relatively new with the city, so if I say anything incorrect, I'm sure Toby will correct me later. <laughs> um, it oversees the um, city, Live Oak, and Incorporated County. The university is our, our largest uh, customer, and the water usage is addressed in two primary elements, our land use element and then the community facilities element I mentioned before. So just quickly in the land use element, um, Really, the goals in there focus on sustainable land uses. So we want to ensure that any growth and development doesn't lead to any overdrafts of water sources. 
And we want to ensure that when a project comes through that any facility and service that's required is available and proportionate to the development density and land use uh, entitlements that are being requested. And then we want to ensure, of course, that new development pays its fair share for any infrastructure, uh, anything of that nature to make sure that it's not a burden on the taxpayers. And then in terms of our community facilities and service element where most of this language lies, our goal three indicates that we want a safe, reliable, and adequate water system. So what this means is that through a variety of methods, we promote maximum water use efficiency, we give incentives for um, you know, low flow toilets, we have educational efforts, things of that nature to really make sure that we're, we're working with our community to use our water efficiently. Uh, we coordinate major land use planning decisions with all of the jurisdictions that are served by our water department uh, to, based on the water supply availability. So when a really big project comes in, we coordinate to make sure that we have enough, um, enough supply. Um, and then, of course, we're always investigating new supply options to meet planned growth, and we work to conserve water resources. So just finally, looking ahead, um, our general plan 2030 build-out estimates estimated about 3,300, uh, just over 3,300 residential units, uh, just over a million square feet of commercial, just over 1.3 uh, 1 million of office, and just under a million of industrial. We currently approve about 100 to 120 residential units a year, but this year, currently, we have uh, applications in for 750 residential units right now in the planning process. So you can tell the economy is doing well, and there's definitely a demand. Um, we are on track with commercial development as well. A lot of those are mixed use projects, and there's about just under 50,000 square feet of retail space in those proposals as well. And the reality is, is that we are behind in office and industrial development. Um, those are, uh, we need them, but there's not a lot of interest in the market in that right now. So both of those uses are pretty tight in terms of availability. Uh, so with that, I will wrap it up. Clearly, we'll do questions at the end, uh, and that's that's City of Santa Cruz. We, um, we no pun intended, we know you are uh, drinking from a fire hose today on this information. All of these presentations are going to be made available to, to you publicly on the agency website this coming week. I think probably by Monday we can do it. So by all means, take photographs. I see so many people doing that, but we'll have all of these presentations today available to you so you can look at them in your leisure. Um, do, as, as uh, Taylor's getting himself set up, um, do please remember to be writing down your questions on your question card. So as soon as we get done, we go into that. Also, panelists, as soon as we go into Q&A, please move your chairs up where everybody in the room can see you. You're a little tucked back. It's, no, you don't have to do it now, but, but just go. Okay, Taylor, go ahead, please. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Taylor Bateman. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Scotts Valley. Um, so I'd like to give you guys a little bit of an overview of what's going on in Scotts Valley. There's actually a very similar discussion going on in Scotts Valley as you guys are having here today. The City of Scotts Valley is looking to update its general plan. As Tom Burns from the previous presentation pointed out, our general plan was approved in 1994. So about... Um, Two years ago, we started on that process. Uh, we've been at it uh, for about a year and a half now. And um, some of the key tasks that we're looking to accomplish with this general plan update is to move forward um, from the 1994 plan. We're going to be incorporating new state requirements, um, such as the new water legislation that we've been talking about today. Um, we're also looking at opportunities to focus the general plan update on vacant and underused properties throughout the city. We're also going to be looking at transportation and mobility options as well. Um, that's a very important part to a lot of residents uh, in our community. We're also looking at community services um, and recreation services as well. That's another important part for the community as well. Um, we're also in the process of, of implementing our housing element. We actually approved our housing element in 19, or 2016, sorry. So we're in works on that. Um, so as far as our general plan goes, we're looking to organize it around general themes. We heard about the different elements that are comprised a general plan from Tom and a little bit from uh, Sarah as well. So what we're trying to do is have these categories that kind of link these different things together. So like in the built environment, we're looking at land use, housing, and economic development. They all play a role together. So the focus is here. So we're not just looking at things in isolation. We're trying to have all of these things be done um, in a uh, robust and connect, robust and connected way. Um, what we have right here is the existing Scotts Valley General Plan land use map. 
I'll go over it here just quickly for you guys. We've seen a couple examples from Tom. So in the top right corner, you see that there's a black red line that a uh, black line that runs down through the center of the map there to the bottom. That's Highway 17. So the top part is Highway 17 to the north to San Jose, and the south is uh, to um, Santa Cruz. Parallel to that, um, there's a strip of red commercial properties there. That's Scotts Valley Drive. So that's one of our primary commercial corridors in Scotts Valley. Um, and then running perpendicular to that, um, off to the left side of the map, is uh, the Mount Hermon Road corridor there. And you can see there's some pink and red properties there. That represents the shopping centers and commercial properties that are there. As you move away from those two uh, corridors, you start moving into some tan and brown colored properties. Those are our high density residential areas. And then as you move forward, further away from those cores out across the valley floor, you start encountering some yellow and green and dark green properties. Those are uh, moving into the hillside areas, steeply sloped, heavily wooded, uh, more rural uh, in nature there. So um, that's kind of what you typically, Scotts Valley's past was a rural past. There's been some uh, urban development that has occurred along those corridors in the central part of the valley. This next slide is a um, just a little bit of a kind of a put a little bit of framework on um, the 1994 general plan had a build out analysis and what you see in the blue columns here is what the 1994 plan was looking at as for build out for Scotts Valley. So you see that for population, for housing and for employment. The red column represents the 2010 census and the data that was collected with that and then the green is the 2035 AMBAG projections. Uh, Paya showed us some stuff there, and that was actually from the 2018. This data set is from 2015. So very similar with some, some growth there. I should point out, too, that Scotts Valley's population is approximately 12,000 uh, people. So that original build-out analysis had a projection of 15, a built-out of 15,000 people in about 2015 or 2018, I think, was the build-out scenario. So we haven't hit those marks that we had talked about in um, 1994. So just to help give us a little bit of perspective there, we're still uh, probably looking at a horizon in our general plan of 2040, and we're probably looking at maybe a build out uh, just a plan for 15,000. I'm not sure we'll even get that close, but that's where we're going to stick with the original numbers there. Um, again, the general plan process is a work in progress. It's still being discussed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But at this point, maybe it'd be worthwhile to take a few minutes to talk about some of the um, current development that's going on in Scotts Valley. Um, right now in Scotts Valley, I'm sure you all passed through there, you've seen some construction going on. Uh, we have approximately 160 uh, residential units under construction right now um, at various stages. Um, most of those will not be uh, habitable in, for another year or two, but they're, they're, in, the, they're in the progress process here right now. And um, I would like to point out too, of those 160 units, approximately, I think, most of them have been in the planning process for about a decade. Um, some have been in uh, works uh, a little less than that, but because of the economic recession, a lot of those things just didn't get built, and so now they're all happening at once. The other thing I'd like to point out, too, is that um, since 2008 to about 2016 or 2018, um, we have built about 100 units. So there was some economic activity, some construction going on through the recession, however, it wasn't um, uh, as robust as we're seeing now. Um, one of the other things that's come up a little bit along the way too uh, in the general plan update process is the future of the Scotts Valley's town center. You probably all heard there's been uh, a, a vision of, to have a town center for Scotts Valley. It would be located between the uh, Kings Village Shopping Center and the Kmart Shopping Center, the old um, Santa Cruz Airport there, commonly known as Sky Park. So that's also, um, been in the planning process in 2008. We approved a specific plan for that. There was an EIR that was processed and approved. Um, they looked at about 250 units there with some commercial as well. So it would be a mixed use development and it would have not only commercial and residential, there would also be town center type amenities there. Town center green um, and different parks and uh, walking and pedestrian activities there as well. As well as community gathering spot. So that is currently um, in the planning stages. We, the city is currently working with a developer to develop a vision for that. Um, there's been a series of community meetings through the fall. I anticipate there'll be another one in February. Uh, the developer is working with the community to get input to figure out exactly what the community wants there, 
how we want to implement that plan. So um, that process, again, as I pointed out, there was an EIR that was prepared for that. That was done in consultation with the Scotts Valley Water District, um, and there were the analysis showed that there would be adequate water to supply that uh, proposed development. Um, just also like to point out, too, one of the things that um, is important for the our Scotts Valley community is affordable housing. So as I mentioned, we updated our housing element in 2016. Uh, there was various goals that were put forward from the state that we were obligated to meet. Of the 160 units that we have under construction right now, I do believe between 20 and 25 of those are dedicated affordable units. Of the 100 that were built over the last decade, there are uh, approximately, uh, I do believe, 15 um, dedicated affordable units associated with that development as well. There are also a lot of other affordable uh, units in Scotts Valley, but this is just what's been happening in the last 10 years. Wanted to give you a little snapshot of that. So just quickly, um, as I pointed out, this is process that we're engaged here today is a very similar process that's going on in Scotts Valley. Um, as part of the general plan update process, we've created a general plan advisory committee. It's comprised of uh, various um, stakeholder groups. We have representation from the water uh, district, school board, fire district, and then we have members at large from the community. So they've been meeting semi-regularly for the last uh, year and a half. This is a picture here of one of our meetings. They're open to the public. Anybody who would like to come is, is welcome. Um, in, in conjunction with this update process, which is, again, is a community-wide discussion about the growth and the future of Scotts Valley, um, we've created a website which has um, all the agendas and minutes from the meetings. It has a way you can sign up for updates if you'd like to participate in that process. Um, it's been a, a very interactive process so far. Um, we've had uh, also a part of this process, we've developed um, what we call community fact sheets. And they're snapshots of trends and facts and figures and demographics and on different categories. We have the built environment, we have one on natural resources, we have one to have on community services, and one on transportation. So you guys uh, could participate, in, you know, get in readily available, digestible information in chart format there for you. Um, part of this process, we've also had a community workshop. We had uh, uh, a lot of attendance at that. It was a great, a great one. We had probably uh, maybe a few more people than you guys have here. Um, out of that came a lot of comments. Uh, we also we put a survey forward to the community, and that community survey had, uh, I think we had over 700 respondents, which was huge. And all of that information and all the work to date has culminated in what we're calling an Envision Scotts Valley document. So all the, the survey results, all of the comments we received, they're in a document about this thick. It's available on the general plan update website. So um, this process is, it, it's in work, and we're looking to definitely coordinate with the different water agencies and make sure that we have all the adequate um, services we need to provide for future residents. Um, and that's all I, time I have, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, so if I could ask the panelists to slide their chairs up uh, closer to the edge of the stage, but not over the edge of the stage. Um, if uh, I'm gonna just look right over here again, uh, question or comment card. So has anybody right over here got a question or comment card that they would like to have? Okay, let me uh, come over here and, and grab them. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll just collect these up, and then uh, colleagues will walk around the room and we'll do this. Um, as fast as we can, so, um, and we'll get through as many as we can. Okay, Santa Cruz, there should be two microphones at least up there, is there? Um, at least grab, you go ahead and grab the one. Oh, you got them, yeah, there's two right there, great, thank you. Okay, Santa Cruz County, Santa Cruz County's most recent housing element admits it is more aggressive than Rena Ambag requires. Um, why, when water is in short supply and um, Paya, if you're going to feel that, go ahead and say what Rena is, please. There should be two mics up there, so or a mic. So, okay, all right, we got one. There we go. Rena is the. Acronym. It's on your mic. Rena is the acronym for Regional Housing Needs Assessment, and it is a uh, a target number um, that it comes through the state process for housing that needs to be supplied in various income groups. Um, I'm going to have to give that some thought because um, I don't know exactly what phrase you're referring to in the housing element, but um, we were working pretty hard to demonstrate to the state that we had plans and programs and space for the amount of units in our arena. So, um, 
I, you don't, I, don't I mean, really one a, thing to cover is that, I mean, Rena, there is a level, there's a moderate level of negotiation space that any jurisdiction has with the state, but it's not unlimited. And I think that, the, would you say, is it accurate to say that this reflects the pressures, that you've got the pressures in a community to maintain a certain scale and size, while at the same time you've got pressures from the state to at least be maintaining inventory for growth? Is that a reasonable thing to say? It's definitely a reasonable thing to say that balance is kind of the crux of what we work with and that area for negotiation is getting narrower and narrower. How does uh, the uh, UC Santa Cruz impact water resources for Santa Cruz and for upcoming for Sigma? Sure. So um, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Um, we do have uh, Toby Goddard from our uh, city team who will be speaking um, uh, momentarily, I think, I, Toby, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think he is probably better suited to give the detailed analysis of what that impact so is. So we'll come back to that. We'll, we'll grab that card. Uh, I'll set it aside and we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, I feel like I'm running a game show. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do. Yeah, what are the prizes? You got stickers. Um, how many of the restrict? How many of the residential permits are for affordable housing of the seven hundred for Santa Cruz? So you have a breakdown of how many of that seven hundred some odd was. Sure. Affordable? So um, since they're in the planning entitlement phase, a lot of those things are being negotiated now. Um, I I'll, I'll preface this by saying I don't work in the in the uh, current planning team, which does the development review. So I'm not up to speed on where all of those negotiations are. But what I can tell you is that the city has a requirement of a minimum of 15% of the residential units need to be affordable or a payment of an in-lieu fee. We always encourage the actual units where it makes sense, um, but sometimes developers need to do a combination or um, in a situation where maybe they're doing a single family development, it makes more sense to take the in-lieu fees uh, because we can get a bigger bang for the buck in developing multifamily with that money. Um, but in short, it, our standard is 15%. Um, there needs to be, I'm gonna, this is a, a bit of a statement, so then you can sort of turn it into an answer. There needs to be qualitative reporting, surveys of what percent of people feel that traffic, for example, is, just, is detracting from the quality of life, reports on residents' optimum quality of life. Um, for example, quality of life compared to, say, 2016. So there's a lot of data that's been shown up there. Is there these more quality, are there any qualitative type surveys that are done to sort of assess what people's experiences or feelings are? And then we'll go to Taylor, he hasn't had a chance to answer. So definitely, if, you know, we have, as I point out, first thing I want to say is there actually is an upcoming GPAC meeting on February 11th. It's at the City Hall. Um, everybody's welcome. So feel free to, to attend that or at least check out the work that's going to be on the agenda on the website. I meant to mention that earlier. Um, so as far as um, the quality of life, um, it is interesting. We do get caught up in these metrics and these measures, but I think that that's why we have these community workshops is so we can make sure that you know, the data and the numbers and the projections that we're having, they actually measure up with the human element. Um, I think that is an important part of any uh, planning project and any projections for our future growth is that quality of life is, is huge and I think that's why we all choose to live here is for that quality of life. So um, that's why uh, we have these hearings and we want to make sure that it's being tempered with that realistic um, input. Can Santa Cruz of the city in good conscience permit the 700 requesting housing permits given water limitations? Uh, sure. So um, I think, again, Toby will be better to speak about um, kind of where we're at in terms of our water plans and water usage. Um, from some high-level presentations uh, or some high-level review of presentations he's done in the past, I think um, we'll be pleasantly surprised to see that water usage um, actually has uh, stayed steady in recent years, even with the new development. And I think a lot of this has to do with good planning, good um, education, in encouraging conservation and new technologies that help us uh, utilize water more efficiently with different um, low flow. I, he, again, he can speak better to it, but there, are, there it has stayed uh, more steady than you might than you might imagine. Just on a, on a similar note too, that's what Scott and the water district could speak better that, than I can, but the, the general trend that we're seeing is, you know, the population is going up over time, not, not a lot, uh, but water usage is staying the same and in some instances is dropping. So. Um, it's, it's a trend there, and it's because of conservation efforts. We've heard various speakers speak to that as well, but it's a trend that we're seeing in Scotts Valley as well. 
And I'm, I'm, again, as I said earlier, I'm sort of reserving some of these cards um, to these kinds of questions. I'm going to be handing it to our water managers who are going to be coming up in the last panel. Can we discourage commuting? Can we make it less attractive for people who work in San Jose to live here? I don't write them. I'm reading them. <laughs> you know, probably not. I will say, though, internal to the city, um, we um, are working on policies that will encourage more walkability uh, within the city, more use of uh, bicycles. We have our bike share system now. Um, we're trying to develop infill uh, in where we already have the infrastructure, in where we already have some density, so we're not coming out the population, because the population growth is coming. We have pressures from UCSC. We have pressures from Silicon Valley. It's a very desirable place to live. So as much as we can try to manage that through infill development and creating things in close proximity to one another so that people don't have to get into their cars, the better off we're going to be in the long term. It's a learning process. It, there's growing pains, especially when we talk about uh, modifying parking requirements for things like ADUs in order to um, create more housing units to house more people. Um, that can be uncomfortable when that increases uh, parking needs on the street, for example. Um, over the hill, I don't know that there's there's much at this point uh, that we can do, but internally the city at least is working very hard to create uh, more infill and walkable areas and change um, some behaviors long term. Okay, we've got time for one more question, so I'll, I'll put it out there, and then I've, I've got to get you guys to a break because we're actually already 20 minutes behind on the schedule. Um, so uh, how, does, how do population growth estimates account for part-time residents, university hotels, tourists, things like that? They are accounted for. There's a different category for that in the in the in the forecast and in the models that they run, um, because in the in the three county area there are military bases, there are universities. So um, I forget what the name is. I uh, it, it, it has a category and it's dealt with separately. So the answer is yes, it's accounted for. No, it's not transient. Um, group, I'll look over group, the break. Group quarters, I think, is something. Yeah, group, group, group quarters course. covers universities, so um, they, they do have that level of refinement. Let me ask one last final question that maybe each of you can just like really quickly answer, maybe. Um, what's the principal growth driver for your respective agencies? I got a woof from somebody over here in the audience. So <laughs> I, That's really tough because I, I don't think we want to oversimplify what goes into a lot of these decisions and what the community needs to think about when they come up with their vision of how they want things to go. So I'm not inclined to pick like a number one thing, but it's a matrix of um, you know, steady but moderate and minimal growth pressure, the ways that people wish to live, what kind of development is attractive to people, um, whether young families can be here or not, what transportation is like. So it's really a matrix of things. Okay. Sarah or Taylor? I, you know, again, I don't think there's a number one thing. I think it's a mixture. But I think one of the things that it's like, and it goes in waves and it changes over time. But right now, housing, affordable housing, um, and certain types of housing that um, you know, Scotts Valley doesn't have a lot of apartments or housing for working class folks. So there's, there's an interest in that. Um, and, and that's a driver for, for, for growth for us right now, I think. Okay. Sarah? Yeah, I think for us, clearly the university has a really huge impact uh, on, on our growth. Um, I think also, with that said, we recognize that there's a need for a range of housing types. Um, we are in, to a degree, a, a housing crisis in the city. We have a, a very large and growing homeless population. The affordability issues, you know, the average a person in the city of Santa Cruz makes about $14 and the average rent's about 3000 So trying to find a range of housing types, making things affordable by design, um, that really is, is um, kind of what's, what's behind a lot of our growth. Okay, let's give a, a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much.